Graham Arman, che è professore alla Università Americana del Cairo, è autore di un gran numero di volumi, per inciso, visto che ha pubblicato molti di questi volumi con una politica di open access, è molto facile leggere i suoi libri, nel senso che se uno va alla sua voce di Wikipedia, molto ben fatta, I, I, I believe that we can trust all the infos we can find in your uh, Wikipedia uh, i haven't checked it for a while, but it looked all accurate the last time I was there. Uh, yes, but uh, seemingly there are uh, no penal charges uh, or other things. In oh, no, no. <laughs> no, so, uh, uh, no, perché in effetti certe volte sono fantasioni, invece questa è molto attendibile, soprattutto al fondo c'è la bibliografia da cui voi potete anche scaricare buona parte dei libri che ha scritto, che uh, semplifica l'opera di chiunque volesse approfondire il suo pensiero interessantissimo proprio perché muove eh, ed è stata la sua tesi di dottorato alla DePaul University your doctorate was at, at uh, uh, DePaul University is it? Uh, um, alla DePaul University che era sopra uh, a Heidegger però una versione uh, relativamente minore di Heidegger cioè Heidegger interprete degli oggetti noi abbiamo questa immagine è in fondo molto soggettivistico in quanto ha ragione di Heidegger, però come sappiamo appunto in essere tempo Heidegger dedica analisi profonde ed acute alla relazione dell'oggetto. Di qui per una generalizzazione, per un'audace generalizzazione, eh, eh, Graham Harman ha sviluppato una, eh, quella che è stata definita anche una object oriented ontology, cioè un'ontologia che parte dall'oggetto invece che dal soggetto, include gli oggetti, i soggetti della categoria degli oggetti, estremamente nuovi e originali, con niente eh, in comune per esempio con Mylong, o poco in comune con Mylong. Eh, ma al di là delle questioni di storia della filosofia è stato eh, probabilmente quello che meglio ha saputo mettere insieme le diverse anime del realismo che si è fatto avanti all'interno della scena filosofica eh, mondiale all'incirca dall'inizio del secolo corrente Uh, ed è anche, come vedrete, uno straordinariamente efficace relatore, oltre che uno scrittore efficacissimo, anche in virtù della uh, competenza che ha acquisito durante la sua uh, tesi di dottorato, dove per un certo periodo ha fatto anche i commenti sportivi per un giornale di Chicago, anche questo fonte Wikipedia, da cui uh, ha tratto scorrevolezza e fluidità della scrittura e chiarezza dell'esposizione. Uh, non uh, tolgo altro tempo alla presentazione di Graham, uh, in serie, uh, uh, as usual, like one hour would be perfect, then discussion. Thank you very much, Maurizio. And I am probably the only person in the room who did not understand that introduction. Yes, of course. <coughs> There was nothing offensive, uh, <laughs> okay. of course. Um, the biggest risk with my lectures is always that I will start to speak too fast. <clears throat> even in English, and even with English audiences. So please raise your hand and don't be shy if I'm starting to go too fast for any of you to understand. And I will try to slow down. But there's a lot to cover here. I have 21 note cards. Last week in Amsterdam, Maurizio and I were both present at a conference on the future of realism. And Maurizio was imagining on the closing panel a future where realism became mainstream enough that instead of arguing in favor of realism, we could start arguing with each other about what kind of realism is the right kind. Well, that kind of argument won't happen in the side of analytic philosophy because realism has always been an option among analytic philosophers. Realism is a little bit strange on the continental sides. And if you want to date this, uh, it's, realism has been shut down as a live option in continental philosophy pretty much since Husserl and Heidegger, who both had contempt for the question of the reality of the external world. But it actually goes back even further to Bentano's psychology, and I'll say a little about this. Um, Realism can, of course, mean many different things in many different fields. It means it has a different meaning in politics or literature or painting or mathematics than it does in philosophy. But even in philosophy, there are many different possible meanings of realism. And Lee Braver, teacher at the University of South Florida, wrote a very good book a few years ago 
where he identified no fewer than six different possible meanings of realism, and he labels them R1 through R6. I think he actually missed the most important one, R7, that I'll get to later, but there's at least six, according to his account. But the usual form that realism takes, that we all understand, is that realism means there's a world outside of the human mind, or a world outside of thought. That's what it usually means. I actually don't think that goes far enough, and I'll say why later tonight, but it's a decent starting point to say that a position is realistic that believes there's a world outside the mind. The problem is that most realisms push it even further in the wrong direction, in my opinion. And they expand this to say realism means there's a world outside the mind and we can know that world. So most realisms are realisms of knowledge. Most realisms don't even see why you would want a realism if it's anything other than a realism of knowledge. The kind of realism that will guarantee that we can know the truth, thereby disproving relativism. Uh, uh, this is what it means for most people and they're not interested in a realism that doesn't do that. I'm going to say the opposite tonight. I'm going to say that realism means that there's a real world, and precisely because it's real, we cannot know it. I'm also going to say that this world consists of objects. All right, let's talk a little bit about analytic versus continental philosophy, since uh, this question of realism is really only relevant to the continental side right now, since it's not controversial among analytic philosophers. Maurizio would never have been in trouble if he had come from an analytic background and defending realism in the 1990s. The reason he got in some trouble was because of the context in which he was in. Now, it's very popular today to say that there is no real analytic continental splits, that there's only one philosophy with a capital P and it's just a sociological division between the two. I believe this is false. I think the division is very real. And I think the best diagnosis you can find of the distinction is in Brentano in the 1890s in a very famous lecture he gave in a very sarcastic lecture he gave in Vienna. It's called The Four Phases of the History of Philosophy. It's been translated by Barry Smith and, and someone else whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, what Brentano says in that lecture is that philosophy is actually ambiguous. In one sense, philosophy is like the natural sciences. In another sense, it's like the fine arts. And what does he mean? Well, it's like the natural sciences in the sense that, in some sense, progress is made in philosophy. In some sense, you're looking for good and bad arguments. You're looking for good and bad evidence. And you could make gradual progress in principle uh, over what we knew about a topic 20 years ago or 30 years ago. That happens sometimes, but it's also the case that philosophy is more like the fine arts, where you have periods of ripeness, periods of decadence, it goes in cycles. Uh, there are great figures, and there are periods with no great figures in the fine arts. Uh, um, no one today would claim that they can paint better than Leonardo or, or Raphael. I mean, there's some sense in which those painters are obviously not modern, they're adhering to older older standards that we use by painters. But no one today would make the claim that they're better than Picasso or better than, than Cezanne. That's just not how you would talk about the fine arts. Whereas we would say that our, our theory of gravity is better today than Newton's. You can actually say that. So that's a difference. Uh, the analytic philosophers tend to treat philosophy as a natural science. It tends to be a collective project dealing all with piecemeal problems that advance slowly over the years. They tend to refer to other things published in the last five or six years more often than they refer to classics. If they refer to classics at all, it's the other analytic philosophy, classics like Quine from maybe 50 years ago at most. Whereas with continental philosophers, you're going to see not a lot of references to each other. You're going to see references more to things that are centuries old. So you're going to see references to Plato and Heidegger and Kant. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to both of these, of course. I come from the continental side, and so that's the, the kind I prefer. Uh, there are some problems, though. It can be the case that continental philosophy can become so intimidated by its great models that people tend to do historical work because they can't see themselves as beating Kant in an argument the way an analytic philosopher might very bravely say Kant is wrong about three points and here they are. Uh, so there's, there's something a little more democratic but perhaps also a little more reductive about the analytic approach. So if you look at an analytic interpretation of Plato, you might see where, what are Plato's wrong arguments in the Theotetus, which maybe is a bit of a misunderstanding of what you're trying to get out of Plato. So again, I think that there are strengths and weaknesses on both sides, but definitely the two are not unified. I'm not going to try to bridge the divide tonight. I think that you cannot do that until you attack this central issue of the two kinds of truth that are important to the, the two traditions, the science sense of truth and the fine arts sense of truth. Someone needs to really strike at the root of both of those. Only then will you see a disappearance of those traditions and something new emerge. I'm going to actually defend the continental variant tonight, uh, just because it gets put down too much. And I, that's what I come from, and that's what I'm, I feel still loyal to. Now, I mentioned Bertano already, and another interesting thing about Bertano, Franz Bertano may be the last philosopher who you can't really call an analytic or a continental. He may be the last one before the splits. Because already with Frege and Husserl, it's easy to call Husserl a continental, Frege an analytic. 
So Brentano is really the person who's speaking right before the split occurs. And of course, what is Brentano the most famous for? He's most famous for reintroducing the medieval concept of intentionality. And he came up with this idea when he was trying to ask about psychology and what distinguishes psychology from the natural natural sciences. It's the, the psychology always has an imminent object. Every psychological act has an object, of course. You wish you're wishing for something, you judge you're judging something, you love or hate you're love or hating something. There's always an object in the mind that you're having some mental attitude towards. That's what makes, and he doesn't think this is true for physics. Physics, things are smashing into each other, but they're not encountering each other as objects, according to Mentano. That's only in, in the domain of psychology, in the philosophical sense. All right, now, what, what Bertano means by intentionality, he's quite clear about this. The intentional object is an imminent object. It is not an object outside the mind. It's an object imminent in the mind. This has been often misunderstood by analytic philosophers. To, to often say intentional object means a mind outside the mind that we're pointing at. That's not what Bertano ever says. And Barry Smith actually catches Dummett, Michael Dummett, making this mistake. Michael Dummett, in one passage on Bertano, says, for Bertano, an uh, intentional object is an object outside the mind. And then in the second edition, that simply vanishes with no footnotes. And so Barry Smith is giving him a good ribbing for that. No, it's just that that's not what it means. So um, here's the problem, though. Brentano never clarifies what the relation is to this imminent object and an object outside the mind. Brentano is not a straightforward realist. We don't know what the relation is of this uh, bottle of water that I enjoy in my mind or a centaur that I hallucinate in my mind to something outside the mind. Brentano never clarifies this. He's focusing on the objects in the mind, the intentional objects. This left Brentano's students with a lot of work to do. This was one of the chief problems they had to work on following Brentano's, not even his death, following his veering off into a different direction. Uh, and two of the most important students of Brentano who wrestled over this issue were Twardowski and Husserl. Kazimierz Twardowski is not as well known, but he's a hero in Poland for his reform of the educational service there. You see him on stamps in Poland. Analytic philosophers still read his book on the content and object of presentations. Now, Twardowski and Husserl, you can see them as rivals in a sense for Brentano's uh, legacy. But in some sense, Husserl was the junior person in this rivalry because even though he was actually about seven years older than Twardowski, Husserl, of course, had started in mathematics and shifted to philosophy later. I was doing some ketchup. Now, Twardowski uh, wrote a, this brilliant thesis called On the Content and Object of Presentations, where he tried to solve this problem by a doubling. You can still get this book in English. I don't know if it's in Italian. Twardowski's book. Yes, it's translated in Italian. Uh, what the, 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 the book you mentioned, the title? The content and object of presentations. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's translated. A small uh, uh, physicist. Yeah, brilliant little book. It's profoundly expensive in English, $110 for a short little book, but I, I bought it, it was worth it. Um, Twardowski says you can only solve this problem with a doubling. There's an object outside the mind and a content inside the mind. So in other words, Twardowski would say there is a real bottle of water outside my mind, but it's an object. Inside my mind is a content. And I'll talk about what that means in a minute. What does it mean to be a content as opposed to an object? Husserl uh, wrestles with this for years. You can see it in some of his correspondence with Twardowski. You can see it in an essay, an early essay he wrote called Intentional Objects. You can see it in a couple of sarcastic footnotes about Twardowski in, in Logical Investigations. Husserl denies the doubling. There can't be a double. There can't be, his example is Berlin. We can't have a Berlin outside the mind and then a Berlin that's a content in my mind that I talk about. Because then there couldn't be knowledge. How would we link the content of Berlin in my mind that I talk about with the real Berlin outside? So for, for Husserl, that's enough to get rid of the double. And this, in fact, is the moment at which Husserl becomes an idealist, where he starts to say things like, it makes no sense to talk about an object that would not at least potentially be the object of an intentional act. You cannot have a, a, thing, a thing in itself, the way comments. It's not referable to directly. So this is the point where Husserl cannot really make the claim he's a realist after he takes this turn. The way he tries to answer Twardowski is by saying, you cannot talk about an object that would not at least be, in principle, directly observable by consciousness. Uh, and I'm gonna come back and show there's more to Husserl than that. But first I wanna take a detour through Heidegger. Because this is what most Heideggerians will say about Husserl, not incorrectly. Heidegger is taking a step beyond Husserl because for Husserl, phenomenology is about appearances and consciousness. Phenomenology is about describing exactly everything that can appear to us, not about some world in itself, the way science tries to talk about. Uh, and so the Heideggerians will say uh, that starting with 
Heidegger's tool analysis, which actually first appears in 1919, eight years before being in time. Heidegger is saying that things primarily do not appear to us in consciousness. Things are primarily invisible, they're taken for granted, they are relied upon. So the floor in this room, you were not thinking about it until I mentioned it. The, um, your bodily organs, unless you're having some kind of medical crisis, are not there for you until they start to fail. The bus, you're not really thinking about until it doesn't come on time. And broken tools in general, the hammer that breaks in your hand, these things become visible. But for the most part, tools are not becoming visible. Now, I want to talk a little about this tool analysis because this is what turned me into a realist, which is interesting because it doesn't turn most Heideggerians into realists. Most Heideggerians are not quite realists. So I attributed this in a different way that I want to explain. Now, uh, the usual way of reading Heidegger's tool analysis, especially in analytic philosophy, is as a kind of pragmatism. They'll tell you that what Heidegger taught us is that praxis comes before theory. We're doing things practically before we notice them. And this leads Richard Rorty to say that John Dewey knew this 30 years earlier, so actually Heidegger is just copying Dewey and Heidegger is adding a lot of historical analyses. But Heidegger is not just saying what Dewey told us, because there's a bit more going on here for Heidegger. Uh, and here's how you can see it. If you're sitting in a chair like I am right now, or if you're looking at a chair, or if you're making some kind of theory of chairs, whatever that would be, none of those are grasping the chair directly, including the sitting in it. Right? Because if I'm sitting in the chair, I'm also oversimplifying it. How do you criticize this theory because you're objectifying something, you're eliminating its dark background that withdraws from, from view, there's always a depth or a surplus to that chair, a being of the chair that you can never adequately exhaust in theory. Okay, that's also true when you perceive it, according to Heidegger. Looking at a chair, it's just present at hand in your consciousness. You're not really grasping the depths of a chair. But the same is obviously true of praxis. You're not grasping the depths, the radical depths of the chair when you sit in it any more than when you're thinking about it, right? Because there's, there's many properties of the chair that are irrelevant to a human that might be relevant to a mosquito, a dog, or another human in some counterfactual situation. A child, for example. This, this chair is very hard to get into for a child. So it's this giant object that they have to be lifted into. So there's lots of things in the chair going on that my praxis or theory or perception never exhausts. So the object is deeper than any of those. I think Heidegger could have been talked into that. Um, however, there's another step that you could never have talked Heidegger into. And that is to say that objects do this to each other. And this is the key to object-oriented philosophy, the most controversial point of object-oriented philosophy. The idea that objects do this to each other no less than to humans. So in other words, Kant was right about finitude. But whereas Kant saw finitude and the inability to reach the self, the, sorry, the thing in itself, as some kind of tragic human problem, we poor humans are finite, we poor humans are trapped in space and time in the 12 categories of the understanding, I would argue that relationality in general fails to grasp the thing in itself. Two things come into relation, they will never relate to each other, relate to each other exhaustively, deeply enough. Therefore, there's always a surplus in any interaction, even if no humans are involved. Object-object relations. All right. Um, now, there are two other things here that Heidegger wouldn't like about what I'm saying. One of them is that Heidegger tends to read himself as a bit of a holist in a couple of ways. One is that even in the tool analysis, Heidegger says, strictly speaking, there's no such thing as an equipment. Equipment is a system. Each item in the equipment, equipmental contexture, refers to the other items. So you're nailing a board. That's referring to the board. The board's referring to the house you're going to build with it. The house is referring to your need to keep dry. And finally, everything is unified by Dasein's potentiality for, for being. And so there's this holism that all comes back to the human need to use certain things, and the human perspective on things. Now, I would just say that Heidegger's tool analysis cannot be holism. The reason it cannot be is because it's not just tools that are important for Heidegger. It's broken tools that are important for Heidegger. Now, nothing can break if, we'll, if tools are really a holistic system. If everything were really completely referred to everything else and were exhausted in that reference to the things, you would never have a broken hammer because a hammer would be nothing more than what it's referring to right now. The hammer is referring to the nail, the nail is referring to the board, the board is referring to the house. Obviously, the hammer is more than those references because the hammer can break, the hammer can surprise you, which means the tool context is not a complete holism. The tools are working together just fine right now, but just wait a few minutes, something's going to break. And they can only break because tools are not just what they're doing efficiently right now. They're also material bulks or other things that erupt and surprise us by breaking down or by doing things we didn't expect. So the holism in Heidegger's tool analysis is not really justified. And he, this carries out in other places in Heidegger's work. For example, being tends to be 
one thing for Heidegger. He's not that explicit on it, but Heidegger, you know, one of the most important concepts in Heidegger is the ontological difference, the difference between being and beings. It has seldom been noticed that he uses this in an ambiguous sense. There are two different senses of the ontological difference working in Heidegger. One of them is the difference that I accept between that which is veiled or withdrawn and that which comes to presence. That's just the, that's the basic Heideggerian dualism. You don't have Heidegger if you don't have that dualism between that which withdraws into absence and that which comes, becomes present before the mind. Ready to hand, present at hand. Um, Romanus and projection, there's a lot of terminological variance in Heidegger. But he also uses the ontological difference in the sense of the one versus the many. So in other words, there are places where he thinks the world is many only in the realm of presence, only in the realm of consciousness. Being itself can't be beings, not just in the sense that being itself is not present, but in the sense that being itself is not multiple. And he's not as explicit about this one as I said. It becomes a little more explicit in Earth when he's talking about the artwork, the strife between Earth and worlds. Uh, Earth, of course, is that which holds itself back in the artwork and creates a strife with that which, with that which is visible in the artwork. But again, there's no evidence that for Heidegger there's different Earths for different artworks. He always, in the very, very vague poetic descriptions that he gives of the Earth, it's always one thing. The Earth is that which nourishes everything and, and flowers up and everything. You can also see this in the early Levinas. There's this beautiful work by the early Levinas, Le l'existence à l'existence, or existence in existence, as it's known in English where he also has this moment where he says that uh, uh, the Ilya is this kind of unarticulated being that we can experience an insomnia to some degree because when an insomnia we can't turn off the world, it's there, it's rumbling, it's something unified about it and it's consciousness that hypostatizes, that breaks things into pieces. And uh, you can find a bit of this in Jean-Luc Nancy in a couple of essays. Of course you can find this in some of the pre-Socratics, the idea that mind is what splits the world into many things. I think it's there in Heidegger too. Now, of course, there's another problem in Heidegger, which is that it's, it tends to be Dasein-centric. Uh, just as for Kant, for most philosophers from Kant onward, not only is it the case that there are things in themselves that we can never reach directly, that's one aspect of Kant, that Mayer so tries to reverse, and that the German idealists try to reverse, right, by saying that there are no things in themselves, to think an unthought is already going to turn into a thought, and therefore you never get out of the circle, and the phenomenon nomina distinction is not really a radical distinction, that, the, that distinction is internal to thought, you see Mayasu say this, you see Zizek and Badiou say it to some extent, it's still very much alive. And of course it's the key to, to German idealism, to getting rid of the thing in itself. Okay, that's one aspect of Kant's. But there's another aspect of Kant's, and that is the, the centrality of the human world relation over all other relations. So in other words, you can't really talk in a Kantian context about two billiard balls colliding together. You can talk about how that collision would appear to humans, but you can't really talk about what it would be like in itself, because Kant cuts off all of our ability to talk about that. We can only talk about it in terms of the categories, and we can't know if those categories are applicable. So those are those two central insights of Kant there. And you could actually reverse the second one instead of the first one. Most people try to get to move past Kant by getting rid of the thing in itself. That's the most fashionable thing today. What if you kept the thing in itself? What if you said the thing in itself is there, but it's not just there for humans? The thing in itself is there anytime two things relate and cannot relate to, the, to each other directly. That, that would have gotten you German idealism. I'm sorry, German realism instead of German idealism at a key moment in history. That is my favorite counterfactual moment in the history of philosophy. You could have had German realism instead of German idealism. And it's quite plausible when you think of how influential Leibniz was in the Germany of that time. That you, you could have had a philosopher who said, yeah, but Leibniz said this too. There are all these objects that don't really touch directly, but they're, they're windowless, but they still somehow relate to each other indirectly. Uh, this could have happened. So that's, that would be my preferred option. So in a way, object-oriented philosophy is just trying to do the German realism 200 years too late. All right. And this is also why I think that realism does not mean there's a real outside the mind. It's got to be broadened to say that realism means there's a real outside relations. You need a non-relational conception of the real. And let me do a quick diversion here on the quantum theory, because um, I'm starting to get more excited about quantum theory. And usually when quantum theory is brought up, in a continental philosophy context, it's brought up with a kind of idealist flavor, right? It's, you see Zizek or Karen Baran say, you know, quantum theory is pretty clear that there's no reality outside of being co-constructed by the mind. And for years, I didn't really have an answer to that. I, my answer was just something like, you, know, you shouldn't appeal to science too quickly, you don't know where science is going in 20 years. But actually, I then uh, gave a joint panel discussion with Anton Seilinger, the Austrian quantum theorist, three years ago at, at the Documenta Art Show. And after he heard my presentation, he said, actually, you could do a quantum, 
theory interpretation this way because it could be that you put an object in a quantum state by subtracting it from its relations. Right? That you, have, you can see some of these films, and there's a film now on YouTube where this physicist, Aaron something or other, maybe it's a TED talk, has an actual particle in a quantum state, and you can see it vibrating. Um, now there's, an old, there's a famous story that goes like this. Heisenberg gave us the uh, principle of indeterminacy, right? That, that, uh, principle of uncertainty, sorry, that, that you cannot simultaneously measure the position and the momentum of the particle. When you measure one, you close off your ability to measure the other with any accuracy. And as the story goes, Bohr, Niels Bohr radicalized this. Bohr didn't like his students' principle and turned it into the principle of complementarity, which is that the object doesn't have both a position and a momentum simultaneously, right? Because it's not just a measurement problem, it's not just epistemological, but for Bohr, it really doesn't actually have both of those at once. It's possible you could push this even one further step and say an object has neither position nor momentum because those are relational properties. Both of these are relational. Being in space is a relational property and therefore the object in its quantum state has neither of those. The object is something weird that has no exact position, no exact momentum, but a statistical range. So it's, that's a possible way you could do an object-oriented interpretation of quantum theory. All right, now back to Husserl, because we were a little unfair to him a minute ago. So far, I've only portrayed Husserl as an idealist who doesn't think you can talk about things outside of consciousness. And I do think that's true. I do think that Husserlians who defended against that charge aren't setting a high enough hurdle for reality. For reality, it needs to be something that is not accessible through consciousness, something that withdraws from consciousness. But there's a problem here, which is that Husserl feels like a realist. It feels like Husserl is talking about hard, material stuff, and he's talking about colors and things of this sort. Why does he feel like that? Well, I say that it's because even though Husserl is an idealist, he's an object-oriented idealist. He's the first object-oriented idealist ever, probably not the last, because Merleau-Ponty also, I think, meets this criterion. Remember what British empiricism said about objects. British empiricism, especially Hume, said there are no objects. There are bundles of qualities. You think you're holding an apple in your hands, you're actually holding red, spherical, hard, juicy, cold, and those come together so often that just for the sake of convenience, you give it a name apple, but that name is just a kind of nickname for a lot of qualities that keep coming together frequently. And you form the habit of calling it an apple. There's not really an apple there. What Husserl really does is reverse this and say, no, you encounter the apple first, you don't encounter the qualities first. What is phenomenology about? It's about subtracting the accidental adumbrations of a thing. It's about forgetting about the way that the thing happens to appear in any given instance and get at the essence, get at the essential problem, the adults of the thing. What, does the, how does, what are the possible range of appearances that an apple could have and still be an apple? It doesn't need to be this exact shade of red in order to be the same apple. He says, if I see my friend Hans walking down the street, I don't say, well, this person looks about 97.2% similar to the bundle of qualities I saw yesterday that I call Hans. And so for convenience, I will call this person Hans again. No, you see your friend Hans. You see your friend walking down the street. He has a different posture, different clothing, different moods. You say it's Hans again, but there are a few differences. The object comes first, the qualities come later. So it's a complete inversion of empiricism. So even though for Husserl, there aren't really objects outside the mind, the way Twardowski wanted, or the way that I've shown Heidegger has to have whether he likes it or not, there are objects in the ideal sphere as well, different from their qualities. So there are actually two kinds of objects, two kinds of qualities, the real and what I call the sensual rather than the intentional. And these all exist in mutual tension, which I, if you read the book, The Quadruple Object, you can see why I call these time, space, essence, and ados. I won't get in that, into that today. I will just say that the, the methods that object-oriented philosophy uses in every field have to do with increasing these tensions and looking at these tensions and taking them seriously, whereas most kinds of philosophy involve collapsing these tensions. So for example, empiricists collapse the tension between objects and their qualities by saying there are, there are no objects, they're just qualities bundled together. Or idealists collapse the tension between the real object and its sensual appearance by saying there is no, there is no real world, that's a fiction, that's a superstition, there's just a world of eminence. Everything is as it appears to be. And not just anti-realists say this, our good friend Marcus Gabriel has a position somewhat like this, where there's, there's no real world hiding behind the, the fields of sense. Okay, now let me say a little bit of it about why I think Western philosophy and science have been anti-object oriented. Most forms of Western philosophy and science have been against the object and so have not been fair to it. This starts with the pre-Socratics, who are usually seen as the first philosophers and the first scientists in the West. 
I, I differ on this. I would actually call them only the first scientists for reasons I'll get into. I see Socrates as the first philosopher. Though I love the pre-Socratics, I don't quite see them as philosophers yet. Now, what do they do? What, give one name to the strategy the pre-Socratics use will be they undermine objects. They're undermining, they're undercutting objects. They're saying objects are superficial. What you're trying to do with these middle-sized objects is break them down and find out what's the ultimate thing that they're all made of. And the pre-Socratics carry on a 200-year debate about what is the right form of tiniest thing that makes up all the big things we see. And of course, water is the first answer that Thales gives. Everything is some version of water combined in a certain way. For a student anaximenes, it's air. You compress air very tightly, you get bone and wood and blood. And if you rarefy air, you get fire and you get stars. For Empedocles, it's air, earth, fire, and water, joined by love, separated by hate. And of course, for Democritus, it's atoms. Still a respectable answer, unlike the other ones today. These undermine objects. And of course, there's the other kind of pre-Socratic that Aristotle noticed, who say, it can't be any of these physical elements. It has to be something deeper and more indefinite than these elements. So it has to be what they call the apparel, this indefinite, this boundless, this kind of a lump-like blob, unarticulated into parts that everything emerges from, that everything passes back into. So you've got Anaximander, and you've got Parmenides, which he calls being, uh, or you've got Anaxagoras, who all think that there's a up here on that either existed in the past, exists now and we don't know it because our senses are too stupid, or will exist millions of years from now once all opposite, opposites have destroyed each other. Okay, now these are the two kinds of theories you get in pre-Socratic philosophy. They share the same problem, which is that they cannot really explain what we call emergence. They cannot explain the fact that, okay, here's my body, supposedly the body, the atoms in your body are recycling every, every seven years. So, uh, this is 2015. Back in 2007, I guess, none of these atoms were here. Some of the cells were here, the brain cells were here and so forth. But the atoms in my body were, in 2006, were not here. They were all in food or grass or somewhere like that. They've been recycled since 2007. Now, is that enough to say that this is a new physical body? You wouldn't say that. You would say, I'm older. You wouldn't say this is a new body. I don't have the same body that I had in 2006. You wouldn't say that Torino is no longer the same city as when Nietzsche collapsed in the square nearby. It's the same city, right? There are enough similarities that we would call it the same city and not just as a nickname. We call this emergence. There's something arises that's larger than the, than the smallest fundamental level that is able to endure, at least for a while, not eternally, but is able to endure for some time, even though the particles have changed or lower parts have changed. Obviously, if you change Torino enough, it's not going to be the same city. We, can, we don't know exactly where that point is, but it would be kind of silly to say that Torino is a different city every time an atom leaves or every time a person is born or dies. Okay, so these are all undermining theories, and they all fail to do justice to uh, emergence. Now, there's the other kind of theory, though, that's the opposite. It does the opposite. It doesn't say objects are too shallow. It says objects are too deep. And this is more of a modern or postmodern view. This idea that the notion of real things outside the mind are some kind of colonial, metaphysical, ontotheological prejudice. All there really are, all there really is, is language or power or um, um, all the things that Maurizio argues against in his books. There's nothing but events, there's nothing but relations, everything, uh, there's no hidden depth behind things, everything's imminent. Most of the popular philosophies today take one of these forms. Uh, Bruno Latour, for example, my favorite living philosopher, is nonetheless extremely guilty of this. Latour says that an object, an actor as he calls it, is nothing more than whatever it transforms, modifies, perturbs, or creates. So an object is what it does. It's not what you think it is. Or you hear Deleuzeans say, I'm more interested in what an object does, and what a thing does than what it is. It's the same kind of idea. Well, the problem with this is that you cannot explain change with this kind of philosophy. <coughs> if something only is what it is, if there's nothing held in surplus, nothing held in reserve in the thing that it's not expressing right now, why will it be different in the future? Why will I, very shortly, a few hours from now, not be sitting here speaking, but I'll be asleep in my hotel? How can I move from one situation to another? because I am not just the person who happens to be speaking at the University of Torino right now. I am something less determinate than that, so that I can do many different things, depending on the situation. This is not a new idea. This is Aristotle again from the metaphysics. Right? Aristotle was arguing against the Megarians there, and the Megarians were saying that no one is a house builder unless they're building a house right now. You are what you're actually doing. Everything is actuality. To which Aristotle said, what about a master house builder who's asleep, or a master house builder who's not building right now? Is that person really a lesser status? and an ignoramus who's trying to build a house right now? No, and this is where he gets his concept of potentiality, which I think has other problems, but it's a good start. A thing is not just what it's doing right now. A thing is something less determinate than that. A thing is, um, a 
the thing is that which can change, but it's not fully determined at any given moment. Okay, so you've got undermining and overmining. These things usually come as a pair. It's very rare that somebody simply defends one or other of these strategies to destroy objects. Usually you get what you call dual mining. You know, let me give you the example of scientific materialism first. What does scientific materialism say in its hardcore form? Everything's made of tiny particles that are arranged in a certain way. That's all there is. Everything bigger than that is you know, just the derivative accidental gathering of tiny particles, okay? That's the undermining version. But then once you get down to those tiny particles, what does scientific materialism think? It thinks you can perfectly mathematize those particles. You can give equations for how they work. We can perfectly know how those things work, given enough experiments. And so the thing goes from being something so small that we can't perceive it, to being something so mathematically definable that we can understand it exhaustively. You've got the undermining part and the overmining part. What they're getting rid of is the thing in between, the intermediate-sized object that is not fully determined. Or take Latour the other direction. I already complained that Latour is an overminer, because Latour says a thing is only what it does, nothing more than what it does. But then about 10 years ago, lo and behold, Latour starts to realize this doesn't work because you can't explain change. And so he invents this new concept suddenly called the plasma. It only appears in two of his books. I think he's given it up now, thankfully. But this plasma is basically the pre-Socratic argument. He says the plasma is what causes change. So he says, why did the Soviet Union collapse overnight without warning? No one expected this. You know, shouldn't it be that the Soviet Union and Latour's philosophy is simply what the Soviet Union was doing in 1988? How could it collapse suddenly and the NATO countries did not collapse suddenly? Latour says the plasma did it. The plasma, this giant indeterminate lump that is able to create changes, where individual actors cannot create changes because they are too specific. And then he says, what about, why do friendships and love affairs suddenly dissolve when no one expected it? The plasma. And my favorite example that he gives, though it's probably never happened, why does the most mediocre academic musician suddenly compose a brilliant symphony? The plasma. So he, he, creates, he posits this lump, this giant hidden lump of potentiality that just randomly makes things happen on the surface. It's like Parmenides, where you've got being, which is one and knowable by reason, and then you've got opinion, you've got doxa and appearance, which is up here and has nothing to do with being. So it's just this dualism with nothing in between. One last example, Tristan Garcia, a name you might not know yet, but he's one of the more brilliant younger French philosophers. Garcia tells us that a table is the difference between its parts and its effects. It's neither it's the atoms that make it up nor the effects it's having in the room, it's both. But all this means is that the table is too sensitive in both directions. So if you change one atom in the table, it's not the same table anymore. And if you move the table one inch, it's also not the same table anymore. So he, he's overmining and undermining at the same time. I don't think it works as brilliant though his philosophy is. Okay, now, why did I bring this up? I brought this up because I'm gonna say something about the arts. I'm often defending the arts and the cognitive value of arts, even though I think the arts are not a knowledge, just as I think philosophy is not a knowledge. Uh, I wrote a piece for that documentary show three years ago called The Third Table. And this was about Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, the great British physicist who confirmed Einstein's general relativity with his eclipse observations. Uh, but he, he used to be famous for something else in philosophy, which is a metaphor called the two tables. At the beginning of his Gifford lectures, back in the 20s, he said, I'm sitting here writing my lectures at a table, but it's actually two tables. There's the scientific table, which is mostly empty space. It's particles flying around. That's what physicists talk about. It's not solid. And that's one kind of table. And since he's a physicist, he thinks that's the better one, right? On the other hand, there's the, the, other, the second table, which is this practical table. It's in my room. It's positioned here. I can move it. I can paint it a different color. I bought it for a certain price, I can sell it for a certain price, a different university could buy it from you, somebody could smash it. Uh, this is the other table. And Eddington sees our life as basically a conflict between these two tables. Uh, sometimes we use one when we're doing science, sometimes we use the other. This is a, in philosophy, this is very similar to, to Wilfred Sellers' talk of the manifest image and the scientific image, which has become very popular now with some continental philosophers even, for reasons I don't quite understand. But, uh, Sellers also thinks that you can look at the manifest image of something or the scientific image, so if you think you understand how your emotions work, but that's just the manifest image. If you really do scientific psychology, you're going to find out there's a lot of chemicals and neurons that really explain what's going on, and that's the scientific image. But notice something here. Notice that he calls both of these images. Manifest image and scientific images, you're left with just images and nothing else. Do you really want a world that's nothing but images? The scientific image is just an image too, even if you think it's a true one. I was trying to say in this, in this essay that no, there's something in between. There's a third table, a third table. 
that is in between those two. Why? Because the first table is simply the undermined table. It's the table where you're saying this table is just a bunch of particles at the fundamental level. The third table, or the second table, is the one where you're saying this table is primarily a practical thing that I can move around. That's what comes first. Um, but there's actually a third table, which is neither of those. It's somewhere in between. And this is what the arts have always been dealing with, I tried to say. So I say why? Well, what does knowledge try to do? If someone asks you to explain something, if someone asks to, you to enlighten them about something, there are only two kinds of things they can do. They can undermine it or overmine it. Someone asks you what something is, you can explain what it's made of, or you can explain what, it's, what it does. Those are the only two directions you can go. Art does neither of those. I'm going to say that philosophy also does neither of those, but art certainly does neither of those. If you encounter an artwork, how do you understand the artwork? You do not understand an artwork by discovering the chemical, chemical composition of the artwork, by discovering how much canvas and pigments and other materials went to make up the artwork. Because the artwork's a form. You have to arrange the materials in a certain way, and so these, simply knowing the physical components of an artwork is not enough. At the same time, you also cannot understand an artwork just by knowing how it makes you feel, or what socio-political impact it has. Like you cannot understand Picasso's Guernica just by saying, this is the work that hardened people's attitudes towards the, the Spanish uh, fascists in the Civil War. It did that, but there's more to it than that. That artwork is still relevant now, or it will continue to be relevant even when the Spanish Civil War may have been forgotten centuries from now. So there's something in the artwork that's neither of those two reductions. You should not reduce the artwork either way. What is it? Well, it's some kind of object, and this object is not knowable in terms of its component pieces or in terms of its effects. An artwork remains a challenge to the interpreter. And this is why art criticism is a lot different from scientific criticism, right? When you, when you analyze something scientifically, it's a different kind of process. Uh, critical thinking. When we think of critical thinking, what this usually means for people is debunking. Critical thinking usually means Charles Dickens thinks he wrote this novel about orphans, but actually it's a novel about the, the capitalist exploitation of the working class of England and the proletariat. This is what it's really about. So you have the hidden key, which is the hidden explanation. Well, actually, there are other possible interpretations of Dickens, too. You, that's not really a good way of criticism. I'll give you an example from Daniel Dennett, who's about as reductionist as it gets. Daniel Dennett writes a, makes a funny remark about wine criticism in his essay on the Finding Query. Dennett says, uh, imagine somebody says about wine they taste, a flamboyant and velvety pinot but lacking in stamina. The kind of thing our, our, our wine tasters say. And Dennett basically says, isn't this pretentious? This is ridiculous. You know, if you want to... Um, if you want to understand wine, just pour it into a machine and let the machine find the chemical formula for the wine. That's wine tasting. It spits out a chemical formula. That's a scientific way to taste wine. Okay, now we can see that. We can recognize that as undermining. My wife, who's a food scientist, says they also do the other kind of thing. They do sensory analysis. They don't just do chemical analysis. They also taste it and taste for certain things, which according to this would be a form of overmining, right? Because you're saying that the wine is nothing more than the sensory things we can taste. What's the wine taster trying to do? The wine taster is trying to get something in between, kind of approaching it obliquely. Now, maybe a little pretentious. Wine critics are sometimes pretentious, but I would say that pretension is simply the risk we run in the humanities and the social sciences. You're not going to find pretentious scientists. You're going to find maybe sometimes boring scientists, dogmatic scientists, unimaginative scientists. You're probably not going to find a pretentious physicist, but you're going to find all kinds of pretentious art critics, architecture critics, literary critics, kind of philosophers. There'll be plenty of those, not always, but we all have a danger of falling into this because we have to describe things in a way that's not literally paraphrasable. What are the scientists trying to do by contrast? They're trying to paraphrase a thing. If you discover something like an electron in science, as they did in 19, or let's say the neutron, which they discovered in 1932, your job is to paraphrase that neutron, which means to find out all the true facts about the neutron. That's what you're doing as a scientist. If all you can do is keep calling it a neutron, you've not done your work. This is not what happens in the humanities and social sciences of the arts. If you're writing a book, uh, like a biography of Napoleon, you're not going to come up with a list of true facts about Napoleon. You're going to come up with kind of oblique, indirect descriptions of Napoleon and wise remarks about his character and decisions. And there's never going to be a final biography about Napoleon that's the right one. But there could be a classic biography that's considered the gold standard for treatments of Napoleon and, and so forth. Because what we are dealing with in our kinds of fields in the humanities are not kinds of knowledge. They are, have to do with something that's other than knowledge. It still has cognitive value, but it is not in knowledge. All right, and I, why do I think philosophy is this way? Because, not the pre-Socratics, 
But uh, Socrates, I said, I, I consider as a starting point of philosophy. Because Socrates does not know the definition of things. This is not just an ironic pose that Socrates strikes. This is, in fact, the, what Socrates thinks. He cannot give you a definition. It's not just that he destroys other people's definitions of justice or virtue or friendship. He never gets them. The, uh, the Eidos is not paraphrasable in terms of words, or even in terms of any direct cognitive insight, I would say. But they remain a permanent subject of dialectical uncertainty. Unless maybe you're a god, assuming Plato actually believed in one. Um, so, it is not the case that a realism of knowledge can have anything to do with what philosophy originally meant. Philosophy originally had to do with philosophia, right? Love of wisdom, not wisdom. Philosophia is about a wisdom you cannot attain. And this is what object-oriented philosophy also says, that we're never going to be able to model the thing in terms of any form of knowledge. The object is going to remain perpetually inaccessible, not entirely inaccessible, but to some extent inaccessible. Now, again, as I've said, um, many forms of realism are realisms of knowledge. They think the whole point of realism is coming up with some superior criterion of determining what's real and what's unreal. Some forms of realism really resemble a slaughterhouse for unicorns. They're just trying to kill all the unicorns so that we can know what's real and get rid of the end of stuff. That's their priority. I recently wrote an article for the Monus, the issue that, that Maurizio was, was editing, and I picked out one typical analytic and one typical continental philosopher who exemplify this. The first is Quentin Mersou, who I've worked with closely at certain times, but uh, ultimately he is a, a philosopher of mathematics. He believes mathematics gives us privileged contact with reality, just as his teacher Badiou believes, and I simply do not see how this can be the case. And so the realisms are starting to fight, as you were calling for. Uh, what does Mayasu say about the thing in itself? Well, Mayasu says, he coins the term correlationism, right? Mayasu thinks most continental philosophy has been correlationism. The idea that you can't think about the world the way it is itself, or about the human mind the way it is in itself, but only the correlation or rapport between these two. And what most people get wrong in interpreting Mayasu is they think he's, he's making fun of this. He's actually not. Mayasu respects the correlationist argument. Mayasu says it's a knockdown argument, there's no way you can beat it. If you want to think a thought, something outside thought, it, that itself is a thought. Mayasu thinks you cannot get out of this circle. He thinks people like me or uh, Maurizio or Bogosian uh, are naive realists because he thinks we're trying to just short circuit that problem and go straight to the real. He doesn't think it's possible. He's a correlationist. However, he doesn't think he wants to remain there. He wants to get back to some contact with the real, but he has to go on this very complicated path through many chapters to get there because he thinks that correlation circle is so powerful. And ultimately, he thinks he's able to prove the existence of the thing in itself. And I won't go through his proof. I don't think it works, but it's, it's an ingenious one. Um, but it's a weird sense of the thing in itself. It's not a thing in itself beyond, beyond knowledge, as it is for Kant, because many of the Sioux thinks Mathematical knowledge can't tell us what the true properties of the thing are. He, think, he, he thinks mathematics can do it. It's only a thing in itself in the sense that it can outlive humans. It's a temporal sense of the thing in itself. So in other words, Mayasu would say, we can perfectly describe this table in mathematical terms. There's nothing hidden or mysterious about it. If we do the science right and the math right, we can know exactly what this table means. But even after all humans are extinct, this table can still be here for a few centuries before it rots and falls. That's all the thing in itself means for him. I don't think it's a very robust sense of the in itself, uh, because he's assuming that the thing and reality are isomorphic. And what's, what's wrong with this? Well, as I see it, let's say Mayasu claims you can have a perfect mathematical model of a tree, because he would. He thinks you can have a perfect mathematical model of anything. You know, the problem is my perfect mathematical model of a tree, assuming I can get one, is not the same as a real tree. Why not? Because the real tree drinks water, the real tree has offspring, the real tree can be climbed. None of those are true of the mathematical tree. Now, someone will respond, that's a straw man, because no one really believes that. No one really thinks the thing in the mind is the same as the, as the uh, mathematical, uh, as, the, as the, real, the real tree outside the mind. But that's not the point. The point isn't whether people can uh, admit that or not. The point is whether their philosophy entails it or not. In other words, I don't care what Mayasu says about that. I care what his philosophy says about it. And what his philosophy tells me is that there's no real difference between the perfect mathematical model of the tree and the tree in itself in the world, with one exception. And it's, I think it's a pretty lame exception. This is my least favorite part of his philosophy. He says that the tree in the world is the mathematical model stamped into dead matter. There's a dead matter that the real tree is stamped in when my mathematical model is not. It's just in my mind. My problem with this is that isn't this 
This is pretty much a throwback to Thomas Aquinas or some really earlier form of Aristotelianism where you've got forms adhering in matter. Um, why would the forms in here in matter is one problem. And another one is how do we extract the forms from matter and know that there's no information loss when we do that. It just brings up new problems that are very traditional and, and didn't get people very far when they came up in the past. So uh, this is, I think, these are the problems that result when Mansu tries to say that we can have an adequate mathematical knowledge of the things in themselves. Now, Paul Bogosian, who comes from the mainstream analytic tradition, doesn't take mathematics to be an exemplary access to reality, he takes natural science to be an exemplary access. And what do analytic philosophers have in common? They're all involved in some sort of science version. Right? At least every analytic philosopher I know is committed, at least unconsciously, to that, the idea that science is basically getting things right, and that science is the best kind of access to reality we have. I love science too, but it's the, not the only access to reality that we have. There are the arts, there's the humanities, uh, and these things should not be seen as somehow uh, degenerative forms of access to the worlds. And here's the other strange thing. Bogosian claims he's a fallibilist, which means he thinks that scientific theory should be falsified over and over again by new evidence. Yet he, def and he defines knowledge as justified true belief. But he doesn't call his book that. He calls his book Fear of Knowledge. We're all afraid of knowledge if we're relativists. He ought to have called his book Fear of Justified True Belief, which isn't quite as scary sounding, but that's what knowledge means to him. Now the problem is, Bogosian admits that we're never going to know if our beliefs are true, right? Newton thought his view of gravity was true, and it wasn't. So the emphasis for Bogosian is on the justified part. When he says truth, uh, truth is justified true belief, what he means is it's just, we have to believe in the justified stuff, because we can't know what the true stuff is. It could be that some crank scientist actually has the right theory that we're going to see in 50 years, right? Someone who's considered an outcast now will actually turn out to have been right about physics 50 years from now. So really what Bogosian wants is he simply, he wants a kind of police action where everyone is forced to believe the most justified scientific theories of our day. He's not so interested in reality per se, he's not so interested in truth because we don't know what that is, because of his fallibilism. He just wants to make sure that no one says stuff that science doesn't currently justify. And I don't see why that should be the case, especially at a moment when scientists don't want us to do this. I can think of at least three top level physicists who don't want philosophers to be following science and flattering what it's already done. And those I, three I can think of are Carlo Rovelli, Lee Smolin, and Anton Simon, who have all said in the last few years that they're getting disappointed with how timid philosophers are. None of us want to make claims about nature. We all want to just talk about how science goes about reaching its wonderful true beliefs. None of us are speculating anymore about the nature of reality or the nature of the, or the beginning of the universe or anything. <laughs> Of course, that, that's, Kant helped make that very difficult, but uh, these, these scientists are hoping to hear more from us in the manner of cosmological speculation, and I think we can probably provide it for them. Okay, I'm doing okay on time, aren't I? Yeah, I've got a few more cards. Oh, okay. Let me tell you one other problem I see with, with Bogosian, and then I'll go to a more important problem that both Bogosian and Mayas have had. Bogosian acts as though the difference between Real and non-real is the same as the difference between nature and human. I really can't understand this. Lots of realists do this, but I can't understand why Bogosian does it. In other words, uh, Bogosian makes a taxonomical difference between the real and the unreal. So the Bogosian thinks that, or, I heard Ray Brassier say this once, that physics is a real science, but sociology is not, because sociology is about people. As though the way to get to the real is to subtract people, as though people weren't real. As Manuel Delanda says at the beginning of his book, A New Philosophy of Society, he says something like, what I'm searching for in this book is a concept of society as it is in itself apart from humans. And he says, that sounds ridiculous, of course, right? Because society, human society is made of humans. And he says, yes, but that doesn't mean that human knowledge can exhaust what society is. These people who criticize that are failing to make a distinction between humans as observers and humans as ingredients. On the one hand, humans are ingredients of society, on the other hand, humans are observers of society, meaning that we're sociologists. And just because we're an ingredient of society doesn't mean we can understand the society. Right? So Vico, in a sense, is wrong. When Vico said we can understand human things because we made them, is that really true? Is it really true that we understand table manners of Western civilization better than we understand neutrons? I doubt it. I really doubt it. There's something real in these customs that resists the first explanation that anthropologists struggle with just as much as physicists do, or even more, to understand human things. Do we all understand our own minds perfectly? No, if we did, then psychoanalysis would never have existed. Because the human mind can be a dark, hard place to interpret. So, um, Bogosian makes this claim almost explicitly in his book that we need to get rid of human stuff. So Bogosian says, for example, 
that it would be a controversial book if you said humans construct the physical world. But it would not be a controversial book to say that money is socially constructed by humans. I think he's wrong about that. You can write a book about money. We don't know what, we don't understand money. We don't understand how it works. You know, Sim, uh, Georg Simmel has written a brilliant book about money. Marx has written a lot about money. Other people have written about money. Uh, uh, we never are really quite sure how it works or what it does. Economics exists because we don't literally transparently understand money. So he's making a false distinction when he thinks the difference between the in itself and the constructed is the difference between nature and culture. <coughs> and I just wanted to point out that this same mistake was made by a very important art critic in a way that has distorted art criticism in the last few decades. This is Michael Fried, who, um, Clement Greenberg was the original hero of Michael Fried, and Clement Greenberg, I think, is a wonderful thinker, one of the best writers of the 20th century, and, and some people think the best art critic of all time, but he's not in favor anymore among artists, because Greenberg was the champion of high modernism, and Greenberg believed that an artwork has a certain autonomy that has nothing to do with its social context, its political context, the biography of the artist. The arts, artwork simply has certain formal properties, as some literary critics also said about literature, that are cut off from culture, cut off from society, cut off from history, and you can just interpret those, those features. Now, uh, Michael Fried, who was once his, his disciple before they had some kind of personal break, accepted that principle, but he also added a further one. He wrote a famous essay in 1967 called Art and Objecthoods. It was essentially a critique of minimalist artists. What did Fried say was wrong with minimalist artists? He said that they're just putting literal objects in our path. There's no depth to the minimalist object. Somebody puts a cement cube in front of me and calls it an art object. Or somebody puts a metallic frame on the wall and says it's an art object. Fried says this is not an art object for two reasons. The first one is that it's just a literal object. It's just a thing that could be bought in a store. It doesn't have any depth to it. It's just there. And second, Fried said that because it's literal, it's also theatrical. And what this means is that since it doesn't have any internal depth, it must just succeed by making some kind of reaction on me. By, 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 forcing some sort of reaction out of me. So it's theatrical. It's expecting me to dramatically react in some way to it. Freed thinks that the literal and the theatrical are the same. I say that they're opposite. It's the same mistake Bogosian made. It's confusing the human as an ingredient with the human as an observer. I would agree with Greenberg and Freed that the artwork has to have depth in it that resists the human encounter with it. Heidegger would even see this, right? That there's something in the artwork that is not immediately perceivable keeps challenging us, if it's a good artwork. It does not follow that the artwork is not theatrical. In other words, it does not follow that the artwork is an artwork even if all humans are extinguished, which Fried would have to say, which Greenberg would have to say, which Kant probably would have to say, <coughs> which uh, Tristan Garcia says in his book, Form and Objects, that the artwork is an artwork even if all humans become extinct. I don't see how this could possibly be the case. I don't think it's necessary. I think the human is an ingredient of the artwork, but the human is not a transparent observer of the artwork. There's two kinds of human things going on. So all art would be theatrical in that sense, I would argue. That's just a, a digression there. I was also going to say that both Manasu and Bogosian slip into the most unsocratic principle of philosophy that we know as Mino's paradox. You might remember this if you've read the Mino recently. Uh, it's actually presented as a view of the sophists, where Mino says, he's reminded of the old principle of the sophists, that you can't look for something if you already know it, and you can't look for something if you don't know it, because if you already know it, you won't be looking for it. <coughs> And if you don't know it, you won't recognize it when you find it. Therefore, we can't look for anything. And it becomes a defense of kind of the laziness of the sophists, not having to search for anything. In a sense, they both fall prey to this, right? Mayasu says you either know something or you don't, right? Because we can't say there's something outside of thoughts, because if we do, we're already turning into a thought. So we can already know the things that are internal to the circle of thoughts. And as for the things that are not in the circle of thoughts, we can never know them anyway. So you either know it or you don't know it. As for Bogosian, Bogosian believes in that old principle that you, you cannot uh, escape absolute statements in philosophy. Because if you say, for example, I'm a historicist, I believe all philosophy is historically determined. Is that principle itself historically determined? This is what Bogosian put the Cardian play on you and say, so therefore there has to be some ultimate starting point. Actually, no, uh, it does not follow that all philosophy needs an absolute starting point. This, this is the idea of philosophy as being similar to geometry, where you have some unshakable first principle that you're deducing step by step. And somehow in the 17th century, we were sold on this notion by Descartes and Spinoza. When actually, as Whitehead points out, this is not the usual method of philosophy. The usual method of philosophy is descriptive generalization. There's no such thing as an unshakable first principle. 
that's not the way to proceed. That's the way to proceed maybe in Euclidean geometry, nowhere else. And incidentally, this is the danger Mayasu faces. Mayasu constructs his entire philosophy as a series of deductions from an unshakable first principle, which means that if any of his proofs go wrong, the whole philosophy collapses. Whereas you wouldn't say that about most phenomenologists or about Whitehead, because they're not, so, they're not always so reliant as Mayasu is on some unshakable first principle. Now you may remember that Socrates handles Mino pretty easily in that dialogue by saying, the real answer is that we're both in the truth and not in the truth. We're somewhere in between. Otherwise, we'd be an animal or a goddess. And so this is the philosophical standpoint, the idea that we're not, we're not trapped in Mino's paradox. We're somewhere in between the two. Now, the usual objection I get to this is people will say, aren't you just doing negative theology then? You're just able to tell us <coughs> what a thing is not. You're not telling us what it is. Well, first of all, it's not theology. And second of all, it's not just negative. Why not? Well, let's look at what negative theology did in tradition. Negative theology was not ever just telling people what God is not, because God is so great you can't say that he's just or any of these things. What you find if you read Pseudo Dionysius, the divine names, considered the founding text of negative theology, is that it's less, less a negative theology than a metaphorical theology. He's telling us things in this book like, how can Trinity exist in Christianity? He says, imagine three different lamps in a house. The light will be one, but you know there are three sources, and yet it's hard to separate out which parts of the light come from which of the three. That's his metaphor for the Trinity. It's actually a pretty helpful, helpful metaphor, whether you believe in the Trinity or not. It, it's, it goes some way to, to helping you shed some light on how that could be possible. Um, so metaphor uh, becomes very important here, and then people will say, yeah, but metaphor, you just turn everything into poetry then. To which I would answer, remember Aristotle's poetics. What does he say there? He says that the gift for metaphor is the greatest gift. Not the gift for knockdown arguments is the greatest gift, as analytic philosophers would say. It's the gift for metaphor is the greatest gift. Because it cannot be taught, and because it finds resemblances that no one else can find. So, uh, what is good about metaphor? I would say it's because metaphor is not an attempt to paraphrase. A metaphor, as literary critics have known for at least 60, 70 years, cannot be paraphrased. You cannot give the literal meaning of a metaphor. You cannot say this metaphor means this, in prose terms. There will always be some energy loss when you do that. You can help do that for a student who doesn't understand anything about what the metaphor means. You can give some commentary on it. But a really powerful metaphor stands the way it is and cannot be replaced or improved upon. Uh, literary critics, at least since the new critics have known this about artworks, about literary works, I'm sorry, but you cannot paraphrase an entire poem. The more you try to paraphrase a poem, the longer and longer the description has to be. You can't really paraphrase a painting. You, know, you couldn't really have a book on Cezanne without any illustrations in it, where you're just describing what the paintings look like because no prose description of a painting can do justice to the painting. You also can't paraphrase a joke. When you paraphrase a joke, you ruin it, you may have noticed. And I used to tell a long joke in my lectures. I'll tell a short one this time. Uh, a few years ago, they did a survey to see which joke, they, they had a list of 200 jokes, and they wanted to see which of these jokes is the most popular in each country. I'll give you the Belgian one, which isn't that great, but I thought it was the best on the list. Most of them are really stupid. But the Belgian one was at least okay. It was, um, there are two kinds of people, no, sorry, there are three kinds of people. Those who can count and those who cannot. All right, it's not that funny, but it's, you can tell it's a joke. Now, if somebody says, I don't understand the joke, you have to paraphrase it. You have to say, well, you see, the guy says there are three kinds of people, and then he only gives two. And it's the kinds that can count and the kinds that cannot. So this person is inscribing himself in the joke. He must be the person who cannot count. How is that funny? But already it's less funny than in the first telling, right? It's already lost something because you have to spell it out. The magic tricks. It's universally agreed upon by all magicians in the world that you never share the secret to a magic trick with a non-magician. The reason for this, again, is if you paraphrase a magic trick by saying, oh, I just I put my hand in my pocket while you weren't looking, and then I turned a dial on this, you know, you're ruining the trick. And you're also ruining it when you do a threat, uh, when you paraphrase a threat. We all know that threats are more ominous when they're not specific. And the best example everyone knows is probably the film The Godfather, with the famous phrase, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse, which is a lot scarier than saying, if he doesn't give my friend the part of the movie, I'm going to cut off his horse's head and put him in his bed while he's sleeping. As grotesque as that is, it's a lot scarier that Vito Corleone was not specific about the threat, that I'm just going to make him an offer he can't refuse. You can't paraphrase hints. You cannot paraphrase innuendos. You cannot <coughs> paraphrase these kinds of statements. And yet a great deal of our cognitive life occurs on this level. A great deal of it. You have an intuition about a person, good or bad, at first meeting. You can't always put it in words. Putting it in words sometimes lessens the value of the gut insight you had about the person at the first meeting. Um, and sometimes you struggle to put it in words. So we all know, in other words, that 
paraphrase is only the smallest part of our access to the world, and yet it's become the paradigm of the only possible adequate knowledge we can have. The kind of scientific version of what knowledge is, or what cognitive life is like, paraphrasing a thing in terms of its true properties, has taken too much of a monopoly on what philosophy is supposed to do and what everything else is supposed to do. So in a sense, and this is my last card, so I'm about to end just on time. Object-oriented philosophy, in a sense, is simply trying to return philosophy to its classical roots, not as a kind of knowledge, as the pre-Socratics thought. And I think Heidegger was wrong to interpret the pre-Socratics as champions of veiling and hiddenness. But they weren't. They were champions of saying everything's made of water, everything's made of atoms. That's what the pre-Socratics were. They were physicists. They were wonderfully speculative physicists. Philosophy begins for me when Socrates cannot come up with the ultimate smallest principle of everything. Right? So in a sense, philosophy is not a knowledge. It's a counter-knowledge, and this is why realism cannot be a realism of knowledge. Thank you very much. <laughs>